Hello and welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I once sold my soul in a Faustian pact and they gave it back. And I'm Gary and today we're going to review and discuss Black Butler Book of the Atlantic which released in 2017 based on the manga by Yana Tabasso and directed by Noriyuki Abe. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis? Well, the story follows young 13-year-old Sio Phantom Hive. His parents have died and he has inherited a demon butler known as Sebastian. And the two of them have decided to take a trip on the Campania headed to America. While on that luxury liner, they will uncover a secret society meeting and face hordes of the undead. <laughs> So this film apparently covers the sixth arc of the manga series. Okie dokie. And is not the first... Well, it's one of the uh, animated movies, but there was uh, an animated series. I think there was two seasons okay. running between 2008 and 2009. I think there was 24 episodes. Oh. And the series follows Seal Pantom Hive, who is a 12-year-old Earl, serving as the Queen's watchdog. And he's tasked with solving crimes in the underworld of Victoria-era London. Yes. And the Black Butler, Sebastian, is his sort of guardian after mm -hmm. his parents have died. Now, I... This is... This is like yeah, complete virgin territory. alien territory for me. <laughs> I know nothing of the Black Butler, mm. the saga, the series, only other than some base sort of easy to find research notes when just looking up what this franchise is. Yes. Only to realise that it's incredibly popular. It scores oh. really high of course they on, are. On, on critic ratings. Yeah. And from those that are really into the Black Butler, the manga itself has been the strongest component that everything that's been, you know, yeah, come out has been based upon. Always is, yes. Uh, but I would also just say right off the get-go, like, because this is such alien territory to me, I am not a fan, oh, I can't say I'm a fan, of Japanese animated movies or TV shows. I, I, I know they exist, I appreciate them, but they're just not for me. Yeah. I've tried every now and again to yeah, get into yeah. some of these shows. But I don't. They don't keep my interest. They don't keep me coming back. No, I get. I get totally what you mean. I mean, like I said, this was virgin territory for me. Gary said this was on our list. I was just like, what the hell is this? And at first, I was quite reluctant when sitting down to watch it. But I'd already taken the time to research it. You know, finding out when the manga had first come out, how long it's been out for, what the basis of the characters are about the ideas basically behind it you know the whole uh, detective victoria uh, victorian era kind of england you know ideas behind it was was really quite interesting and then obviously giving it a quick wiki you know to find out what the story was for this one because i was i was unsure at first i said well why aren't we doing the first movie that had come out but the, it, that wasn't the patron's choice the patron's choice was this one which you know i think the first movie was a live action and, you know, live action anime, you know, adaptations never really go down. So thank you for allowing us to see the, you know, the animation behind it. Because that, for me, is like seeing the manga come alive. And so sitting down, we see these, you know, we see these characters getting ready to board this ship, the Campania. Um, you know, it's, it's very beautiful to look at. The animation is very, very pretty. But I do expect that. This is... You know, yeah, 20, was, 2019. One of the things that caught me off guard straight away was um, how lush yes. the visuals were. They were very vibrant and colourful. Yes. The art design, you know, there was lots of um, lots of details in, in lots of the background, mm. uh, which I really appreciated. It was very immersive in, in terms of uh, oh, the yeah. presentation. The only thing is, like, I... I I have this like reservation when I watch Japanese animated movies is there are so many characters that just talk with their eyes closed. <laughs> and I was just like, and straight away I was like, okay, I'm, 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 he I'm feeling these tropes come in almost immediately. Oh, totally. Like, you know, you, you just, you just getting them off the bat. I mean, I almost didn't, I almost gave up with it as soon as Elizabeth Midford turned up and her voice started. And I was like, <laughs> she's not going to be like this all the way through this movie, is she? And she is, but there's reasons behind it, which I, I, I really liked as, as the film went on. Um, you know, I got to bring up like the different characters that we initially see that don't come aboard the ship. Because 
from what I understand, and you know, don't get me wrong, don't hit the keyboard too hard if you're like, Yeah, no, you're saying their names wrong. They're not that character. You mixed up. Right. I'm apologizing, okay? I made the notes really quick. I had a beer. It was just a whole thing. So, like you said, we have we have Seal, you know, we have Sebastian, his butler, but we also have Snake, his footman, Baldrog, the cook, Finian, the gardener, Mayrin, the maid, and Tanaka, the butler who are all on the side of the dock, you know, saying goodbye to the young master as he's boarding this ship. And we come to understand through, through some flashbacks that the reason why Seal would go up aboard this ship, along with Elizabeth and her family, who are... They like him. Some of them like him. Well, some they're betrothed, like... aren't they? Yeah. Well, so it's yeah. like, why do they detest him so much if they've got this arranged marriage? I was like, well, I guess we're in England. You know? Well, we are also so far into the story that there's so much that I don't know. Yeah, that's it. Like I said, this is the six arc. We're just kind of going along with it. I mean, I, I kind of accepted that, you know, the, 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 the brother-in-law didn't like him just because that's what brother-in-law is supposed to do. The father-in-law wasn't was unsure about him because that's what fathers are supposed to do. But she's completely besotted with her boyfriend. You know, she she's loved him ever since they were kids. But the these other staff members, they're not coming aboard the ship. They're gonna stay there. And it's just Snake, Sebastian and Seal who are going aboard because they've uncovered, or more importantly, Sebastian and Seal have uncovered information of the secret Aurora Society who are meeting aboard the Campania in two days. And if something like that's going to happen and Elizabeth is there, then Seal obviously has to be there to try to help them all out. You really get the feeling from whoever is voicing Sebastian. Obviously, we're, we're, we're listening to the original Japanese uh, voicing, but I'm sure the dubbing is pretty much the same, where Sebastian's character just comes across as so suave and so smooth. Right, you know. Right. He, like, yeah, of course, he's like a fucking... Um, God knows how old demon. Exactly. Well, we don't... I mean, because this is my first introduction to the character, this information is kind of drip-fed yeah. uh, as, as the film goes on. We don't. I don't really know the extent of his power, what he's capable of, if this is real form. Dude, or... he's a demon. Like, of course he's, like, super powerful. Well, I mean, <laughs> there's lots of super powerful characters oh, in yeah, this true, movie. Yeah, so it's like, well, on a scale, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, dude, what scale are we measuring? All I know is that there's a bunch of demons and weird people on this Titanic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And it's about 15 minutes into the film. I mean, I, I honestly admit, I, the first 15 minutes of the film, I was just like, yeah, this is going to get painful for me. Uh, but at the 15 minute mark, mm. after all the characters have got onto the ship and they've had all of these conversation pieces, we get to the exciting stuff. Yes. For me anyway, because <laughs> like, the first 15 minutes could have been anything. <laughs> uh, but we find that we've got this doctor who's professing that uh, humanity has a sickness that can never be cured. Yes. Essentially, and that is death. And he has invented this machine that will bring people back to life. And they wheel out this corpse that's laying there, th this girl, and they get the machine on. We've got the grieving parents, or the, they're still there. Yeah, I think they're members of the Aurora Society, and they're... You know, their daughter has died, or just, something's happened to her. We won't know at this point in the movie, but she's given this uh, treatment from this machine and he brings the corpse to life. And I was, and first time for me, like, like with Gary, I was sure uh, we were both sitting there thinking, oh, how's this going to go? And then the mum walks up and she starts to hug her daughter and the daughter's blindfolded. You, all, all the zombies seem to be in this movie as well. They're all I, blindfolded. I don't know if it's a Japanese burial. Yeah. Right? I don't know. Thing. Um, but you just see something in that jawline when she's hugging the daughter and I'm like oh oh she going to oh she going to and she does <laughs> now the film's not very gory but it is very bloody yes <laughs> and it just all basically sets up that this thing is now attacking the, the entire society and Sebastian obviously has to help Sio and Sio's trying to uh, find an escape route. But we are introduced then to Ronald Knox who comes riding a lawnmower. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, what is this? 
<laughs> and he literally just lawnmowers her face off. Yes, yeah. And then immediately starts a fight with Sebastian. Yeah. <laughs> I, I basically, I researched this and I'm not entirely sure what all this means. So please don't destroy your keyboard. But uh, Ronald Knox is a grim reaper or works for this, the, this group of grim reapers. And he's supposed to go around and collect souls. And so we'd already see, seen him get on board the boat right at the beginning and meet a few people. And he was always just trying to be in the right place at the right time, you know, as a Grim Reaper is supposed to do. And it turns out that the lawnmower is his death scythe. Right. Well, that's a interesting twist. I know, because <laughs> this is Victorian, you know, fucking era, world, London, wherever. A, ha a lawnmower, a motorised one that he can ride. Right. <laughs> And it can also chew up the blades that Sebastian throws at him as well. Yes. So yeah. we know that it's very, very sharp. Yes. <laughs> and so Sio also makes his way through the ship. We come across uh, his friend Snake, the footman, who is just such an amazing character in this. It's very much so a standout character. I mean, it's a bit weird at first. You're like, wait a minute, <laughs> is he talking weird? Oh no, he's talking for his snakes. Yes. The snakes that he carries on his body. Is he a demon? I don't know. <laughs> I, I hadn't properly, properly researched it, but I just know that he he carries these snakes with them and where they see or what they know, they tell him psychically and he talks to them. So basically he'll just look and be like, hey, look, it's over there, says Oscar. <laughs> hey, look, it's over there, says Judith. You know, he just goes through the names. I, like you said, it was weird at first, but with everything going on, I just kind of got along with it. <laughs> yeah. So our, 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 our heroes, question mark? Yes. <laughs> decide to go and investigate because apparently there was lots more of these coffins or bodies brought on board for this show and tell, I guess, of this technology. I mean, they, they only needed to resurrect one person, but apparently there's, there's hundreds of these yeah. dead bodies. And so they go into this room and they see this, all of these coffins hanging. Once the lights go on, that they start shaking. So yeah, we know that the yeah. bodies inside are trying to break free. And they do almost immediately. And we get another pretty great action sequence as they're just decapitating, slicing and stabbing yeah. all of these zombies in this hold. Because they actually work it out as well. They realise, hold on a minute, we we can't just, you know, shoot them and put them down. We have to pretty much dismember their head or bodily dismember them. So you are just left with these great imageries of, of you know, blinded zombies stumbling around trying to eat people and lawnmower demons and fucking demon butlers just chopping things left or right. So there's like this moment where he sees Sebastian ripping all the zombies apart and he it takes him back to the the dancing darkness or the demon that he'd first seen when he had summoned Sebastian because it it turns it transpires that when CO had been kidnapped and his parents had been killed he'd been physically and sexually tortured by his his captors and then he'd been sold to some fucking demon worshippers and when they went to try to summon a demon CO got to it before they did and the demon basically answers him and obviously that's the fancy impact that he has with Sebastian but he has to hunt these people down for revenge so Sebastian is completely loyal to him and it doesn't come up until the end I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it up now but it doesn't come up until the end this backstory which the placement at the end is completely off Oh yeah, completely off. Oh, exactly. The pacing for this film, in in when there's only twenty five minutes left of the film, yeah, the film takes fifteen minutes of that ending to give you a backstory which goes all the way to the beginning of the entire story. Yeah, which uh, be, before this film even, which which I liked because well, yeah, it because fed for me, me the information. you did know nothing. Yeah, it was important. But that scene could have been right at the beginning. That's, that's it. It could have been. It could have been anywhere during the sequence leading up. I understand why it was there, and we'll get to why it happened. But like we said, once it happens, and you're sat there for fifteen minutes, going, "Really?" Um, but yeah, we started to get fed these tidbits from Sierra about the backstory, and we also get the the um, the revelation from Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth, like I said, had been annoying for. 
30 to 40 minutes of the movie running around high-pitched voice. What is it with the high-pitched voice? Like, what is it with Japanese girls and high-pitched voices? Like, is that a thing? I, I don't know many Japanese girls and the ones I do don't run around going, Ay! you know, so... It's a, it's an anime it's thing. It's an anime then? thing. Yeah, yeah it's, it's got to be because it's again it is one of those things that I can't abide either. <laughs> that's it. Like she, it started to get a little bit annoying. But there was a point in the movie where they were being attacked by lots of zombies. And well, they realised, don't they, that the all the zombies they kill all the zombies in the, that room. In that first, hold, but then hold, it's yeah. announced that there is actually ten times more zombies on the Titanic somewhere. Yeah, in a like, second what? hold. So why did you need that many? <laughs> What was like? I was what, like, well, no wonder all the Grim Reapers got the MO to come on board. Yeah. They were like, "Well, shit." Yeah. Wh why? Why did you have to show people what this machine can do? You obviously know it can work. You made a thousand zombies with it. Well, I mean, he eventually finds out, you know, that he was tricked into making this machine by yes. another demon yes. who gets introduced during uh, during the film. I mean, there are so many weird eccentric characters in this. Grell Sutcliffe. A <laughs> red-headed, chainsaw-welding, sharp-toothed Grim Reaper who also works with Knox, who's just stood on the iceberg waiting for the Campania to hit it. Right. <laughs> Did you know it was coming this way? Yeah. Because <laughs> we get a shot of the captain, don't we? Who uh, you oh, know, All the orders are going in and then the captain here just falls over. Yeah, dead. yeah. He's totally dead. <laughs> because all the zombies have broken out and now eating everybody on the ship. So I'm, I'm assuming, and you know, stop me if I'm wrong, I haven't fully researched this, but I'm assuming that when people are about to die, the Grim Reapers get the MO and they must have got the email to tell them, look, there's some people that are going to die on the Campania. Yeah. And so they've headed to there and they just know that they've got to, they don't know why these people are going to die. They just know a lot of them are going to die. Because, I mean, he's got, like, a, a huge book with all of their, their, their pictures or their profiles in there. And he's yeah. stamping every soul that he takes. Yes, he's going. And and it, it it's still building up. Because, like we said, Elizabeth has revealed herself to be this magnificent fencing artist. Like like we said, she, she, she'd been quite annoying. But when they started to be attacked by these zombies, she's almost about to get eaten. Sebastian's not even going to get to her. And that was quite nice. You're getting to see, even though Sebastian, you know, deep down inside is this black-hearted demon. He is still loyal. And so when Co is screaming at him that he's got to save this person or do this, Sebastian is there doing everything he can. Uh, and we, like we said, but it got revealed in the flashback as well that he's not really allowed to use his powers in front of people because Co doesn't want people to know that Sebastian's a demon. You know, it would be really bad for his position as this Earl. Um, but she rips everything apart. She kills bunches of zombies, and then she reveals. Elizabeth, in her backstory flashback, that um, one morning when they were really little, Seal had expressed to Elizabeth that he didn't want his wife or his girlfriend in the future to be a strong woman. He finds it, them scary. He finds them scary. So she spent her entire life practicing and training herself to be... Well, uh, she's pretending to be cute and ditzy in front of him because, because she, thinks she thinks that's what he that's, wants and she wants to marry him yes but she's also part of this other family group who are amazing like her father her brother the the auntie you know they're aboard the ship they are kicking zombie ass yeah you know <laughs> And so, yeah, we get this whole sequence where she's like, don't look at me. Uh, I don't want you to see me this way. You'll never want to marry me now. And he's like, oh, actually, I, I kind of like it. It doesn't matter. She's yeah. like, oh, really? I <laughs> like the change in art style there because you the, you see it in manga as well in the in, in the comics where they're there with the dresses and the umbrellas and they're like, oh, look at me. I'm cute. And then all of a sudden she's just killed a bunch of zombies and her hair's in front of her face and she's a bit tired. Like she mentions about her shoes. Right. She doesn't wear heels because her boyfriend is... She's taller than her CEO, basically, while she's wearing shoes. So she wears flat shoes, which makes her more proficient in combat. I was like, that's that's quite cool. <laughs> I don't know. I found the whole thing to be a bit much. But I'm like, okay, it's a, it's a Japanese representation of Victorian-era London yeah, yeah. sensibility. So it's like... I, as a backstory for this character in this story, <laughs> yeah. thank you. Because even some of the best movies don't give me enough of this backstory. And then you just filled in this character for me. You know, like we said, while we've got also Sutcliffe 
and and Knox running around and and Co and Sebastian uh, go to the lifeboats and they they drop Elizabeth off and you know Sebastian even gives her a judo chop knocks her out because yeah. he knows she wouldn't go otherwise yeah and she has to leave with her family because Co and he ha have to go back and destroy the rest of the zombies because the Titanic is also sinking at this point yeah <laughs> we've seen many flooded compartments yes <laughs> yeah and the film doesn't really let up on. Like, the drama or the action that's going on. Like, you will see zombies stumbling around corridors, killing people that you know are obviously lost. And then you'll see sections of the, the ship, people trying to help each other. There's, like, one moment where there's a guy trying to help up two people on the side of the ship. And a box comes down and knocks him out. So it takes him and the two people as well. I'm like, yeah, okay, like Gary said, the intricacy of the detail in the animation is kind of what keeps you going. Yeah. Now, there was one aspect that I really liked about the, the stylistic choice of, of this, this anime. Yeah. I don't know if it's uh, in the manga or not, but um, it, it's the moment where the film, this film, shrinks down into film strips. Yes. And uh, it's kind of like, uh, I guess, um, symbolic of people's lives and the film strip hitting uh, the, the end moment. Yes. Yet some yes. of these film strips continue beyond the end in their... I, I, I don't I don't know what it, what it represents, life. but he explains that these bodies don't have their souls in them anymore. Yes. And that these zombies, these husks of human bodies are now devouring flesh to try and consume the souls of their victims. Even though we are also explained that they cannot ever take somebody else's soul into themselves. So it's a mindless endeavor that these zombies are on anyway. Yeah. But that's the, the horror of, of it all as well. Yeah. Uh, but the, I just like the stylistic choices of seeing like the tree of, of waving film strips. Yes. Uh, and and the, the there's many sequences in the film as well uh, where, where you see those film strips or you see other stylistic choices that the directors made in, in order to get this image across or this message across. Yeah, because this is all uh, explained to us by the character Undertaker, which obviously or, or, almost immediately piqued my interest, um, but it's not the WWE one, shame. Um, he basically, he was there at the beginning when the uh, Aurora group first got together, um, but he made out that he was just kind of, you know, there in the background and he was just going to watch. And so Sio and Sebastian were immediately suspicious of them. I think, I'm guessing they've had run-ins with him in the comic and the anime and things like that. Um and then he reveals himself again when the Viscount has stolen the machine. Because this Viscount, who's part of the society, he wants to turn everybody into zombies and make his own army. Um, but the Undertaker, or Undertaker, explains, Ha ha, no, it was me. I did it all. I made these people have elongated lives, took away their souls. I mean, this it kind of confused me. I had to rewind and watch it twice to fully grasp what he was explaining. Because I, I assume he's done this before and Sio and Sebastian have dealt with whatever he's done with before. They just didn't know it was him. Um, and now is the feral reveal of, ha ha, it was me then as well, blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, he has these little film reel moments and he shows the ends and he explains that the zombies are uh, just going to try to eat everybody's soul. And then it's a fucking throwdown fight between Sebastian... Well, you basically have Sebastian, Knox, and Sutcliffe all trying to fight Undertaker. And he's just holding his own. Yeah, he whoops all their asses, he really. He whoops all their <laughs> fucking asses. <laughs> <laughs> I do like the moment where... Uh, he uh, brandishes his real oh, scythe. His death, his his death, death scythe. scythe. Oh, the the yes. skull, yes. torso, the blade, the shine of it all. I was like, this this whole sequence, and I think it's like a church room. Because okay. you've got like the stained glass windows in the back and the pews and the balconies. Well, I think no well, I think it's supposed to be like that, but I also think it's just a part of the ship, like a like a dining hall in the ship. Sure, sure yeah. Are. But doesn't he come off as a bit Sephiroth? Oh, oh, very. <laughs> yes, yeah, the, the hair. I don't know, he's got the scar. <laughs> the giant, yeah, the giant blade. But no, I mean more so his mannerisms, his character. He's basically like, ha, 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 I am so much smarter than all of you and so much stronger than all of you that this fight I'm only just doing for fun because funsies. 
And it's it's cool. I mean, Sutcliffe is just getting so annoyed because his chainsaw won't cut through this. It wouldn't cut through this wooden thing that uh, Undertaker was holding. And then he revealed it was his death side. So there's this whole shock reveal. And him and Knox get injured and sliced to the side. And then while he's fighting Sebastian, and Sebastian, is, you know, I get, this is my first time watching, but I get it that Sebastian is pretty badass. And he's still being kept in the back by, uh, by Undertaker. Undertaker. Yeah. But he, Undertaker is so fast, he grabs Seal, you know, distracts Sebastian, because Sebastian knows he doesn't want Seal to die because he wants to eat his soul, so he's going to do everything he can to protect Seal. And as Undertaker throws Seal to the side, Sebastian leaps to save him, and that's when he gets the death scythe to the back. And you're like, oh, fuck, you know, that looks like it hurt. Now we go through 15 minutes of flashback. <laughs> yeah, and now... Like I said, it's a great, great sequence. I think should have been at the start of this film. Mm. Like for, for, especially for someone like me who's coming into this not knowing anything, this would have been a great setup for the rest of the story. Now I know, like, oh, we're we're, we're left to believe that Sebastian's in peril now, mortally wounded. Uh, so mm, really? we have this whole flashback now until we get to find out whether he lives or dies. Yeah. Um, but it, it's a great backstory, great introduction to these two characters, their relationship, how they work with each other, how he literally treats him like a slave butler. I suppose in a way, if I looked at it like that was the end of an episode where Sebastian took the scythe to the back, yeah. and then the start of the next episode is the flashback, is a flashback, flashback kind and of, then reveals yeah. it, then that, that Maybe works. that was the format in the books, I don't know. Yeah, or maybe but, that was But the... just the pacing-wise for a film... It's so jarring. Yeah, maybe that's it. They didn't know if this was going to be a film. They maybe set it up for an episodic thing. And then somebody went, no, no, no we're going to turn it into a movie. And so they had to just stitch it all together. And that's why to us, it's like, oh, it's jarring. But yeah, because yeah, we, we watched the whole flashback. I liked it. Like it, it shows some real background story to Seal and what he was doing and why he is kind of the way he is. Also yeah. Sebastian It, it was probably standing. my favourite scene in the whole film mm. actually because yeah. it was very character driven. Yeah. Uh, we really got to find out who these characters are outside of all of the action going on and the way that they are with each other. Yeah. It was really interesting to watch. And then I suppose it does kind of make it nice because when it comes back you know we do realise that Sebastian is still alive. Seal is worried. You know he is a, he's a bit worried that his butler is just taking this mortal wound but the ship properly sinks during all this moment as well i mean the undertaker pulls out his scythe and literally just cuts off one whole giant end of the ship right he cuts the ship in two i was like <laughs> what the fuck but it's an anime i'm like i don't care but what the fuck dude? yeah and so we see it listing we see the ship smashing down into uh all of the 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 survivors that are floating in the ocean at this moment yeah um, and and they split up. I mean, the group gets separated, but but this kind of sets up because Seal manages to grab some kind of trinket of Undertaker's, who seems really shocked that he's lost it, but at the same time not bothered because he's just going to come back at some point and take it back from Seal. So he fucks off. Um, and obviously the two the, the two Grim Reapers they've disappeared because Sebastian has to get Seal to safety. He knows he's not going to survive in the water very long, and he certainly won't survive if the ship sinks. So he basically just runs through the ship past everybody, carrying Seal towards the end of the ship. I mean, it was beautifully animated because the ship is just starting to get further and further upended, and he just basically gets to the very top, sticks a life preserver. So, uh, you know, buoy thing ring onto Seal and launches him into the air <laughs> and goes down with the ship. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, he resurfaces and swims up next to uh, next to him. Who's well, uh, Seal falls, doesn't he, he from, his, uh, from his from preserve, yeah. and uh, and he's rescued yet again, and then put into a life raft. Yeah. So well, he was like, "Yeah, I grabbed this boat off the the sinking ship." <laughs> yeah. But, oh, okay. He's a demon, dude. Yeah, he's dude. a demon. He's, he's sure. super, super sure. fucking strong. Sure. He just shot through, knew exactly where, because he can he can sense uh, the mark. Seal's got I don't know if it's the purple thing on his eye or the mark on his hand. That he can just sense and he knows exactly where he can go um but while he's there the zombies start to come up from the ship because obviously they don't breathe they're not going to drown so they're just literally launching themselves at the only soul in the closest vicinity 
And so CEO basically says to Sebastian, look, you're going to have to protect me um, and do what you can. And he kills them all. He, well, <laughs> I, I knew he would. Well, yeah. It's like, a oh. shitty ending to an animation. <laughs> if CEO just got eaten and Sebastian was just like, well, I'll go back to hell. Yeah. You know, but no, he, 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 he kills all the zombies and... That's it. They basically just sit there, don't they? And they see the rescue ship turn up. Yeah. Pulls up alongside them and then roll credits. Yeah. I was like, uh, I was like, okay, that's a fine story. But yeah, there was no, for me, they didn't feel like there was very many high stakes because all these characters, maybe they, have they had this history? Has this been an ongoing fight? All the villains really get away by the one doctor that was brainwashed into building this device. Yeah. You guys. I was like, so the film doesn't really resolve anything. It doesn't really develop the characters too much, other than Elizabeth. Um, and so I was like, "What was it? What was the point?" It, the point is to obviously get it out there to bring more people in. As as a first time viewer, if if I was really really needing needing something to read at the moment, I could easily just jump into this because this has basically told me everything I need to know about the characters and what kind of adventures they go up to. Yeah, for me, it's because I'm literally just seeing a porthole, you know, <laughs> vision of this entire, you know, tapestry. Oh, well, yeah, And so yeah. I'm not really seeing the, the big picture here. But, but, it was just a snippet in this the, the, this grand this story. This is why you kind of have to do it a yeah. little bit more every now and again. This was the same thing with Akira, same thing with Fist of the North Star, same thing with kind of Ninja Scroll and a lot of manga animations that have come out where... Well, Akira was very self-contained. Well, not, <laughs> not really, because it is based on a bunch of the manga, which is obviously set over like 60 to 70 <laughs> odd comics. So the story that we got was based over like this yeah. whole massive arc, you know. It's, it's the Legion. It's kind of like Violence Jack. You know, sure, Violent yeah. Jack was like two standalone episodes. And I'm like, what the fuck's going on? But man, it didn't make me want to watch it. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Liam, what were your favourite scenes from the film? Uh, man, uh, a lot of my favourite scenes were just uh, a lot of the fight sequences. I mean, the first couple of zombie outbreaks were really well done. Better than even some of the most recent Resident Evil fucking adaptations that we've seen. These zombies were actually out there and vicious. We saw people just being eaten. Yeah, there's not much gore, but there was a lot of blood, you know, and especially when people started to fight. I was glad there was just lots of zombies there because we got to see you know, zombies getting their heads popped in and arms ripped off and things like that. You'd never be able to get away with that with other other uh, live people. Um, but then I did, there was that really cool bit in the flashback sequence where um, CL shouts out of his window at Sebastian, he's being too noisy because he's killing all these intruders. And so the next time we see it, Sebastian comes up with a knife behind this guy and he's just like, you've got to be quiet, the master's sleeping. And then just kills him quietly. I like, <laughs> Man, I can get behind that. I, I did really love the Elizabeth uh, revelation of her being this amazing fencer. I apologise if I, I, I seem rude or off-putting about the annoyance of the cutesy style and the high-pitched voice. But it, it that just isn't in me. It grates on me. Uh, but her revelation that she's not actually this character. She's a lot stronger than this. And Zio's kind of realization and actual oh it doesn't change my feelings for you yeah. actually makes them stronger really did like that too nice uh my first favorite scene was the introduction of the first zombie the first resurrection yes uh and the family being there and then the first zombie biting of, of the mother uh up until sebastian taking her out with his dagger blades I was like that was a great 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 entire sequence of events there yeah i loved the uh, the entire fight in that i call it the church room mm. the room with the the elaborate glass window oh yeah 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 um i thought the sequence there was really great uh, there was like again because there was lots of stylistic shots here and the one that stands out the most is the shot where it's like a black background zombies at the bottom of the frame and these lips talking you know oh, it was him yeah, talking yeah, but yeah. it's the way it was yeah, shot and presented yeah, i was yeah. like all of those yeah beats like that in the film I was like these are really interesting choices and you know really just breaks away from the traditional uh I guess storytelling to have these bizarre sequences in the film yeah uh, just like the film strips um so yeah all of those were the moments that really stood out for me because they were against the, the norm as far as uh, I know yeah <laughs> and of course my favorite entire sequence is the 10-15 minute flashback towards the end of the film 
where we find out about these two protagonists, really. I thought it was really heartfelt. Uh, and again, like we got to see the uh, the way the two characters behave with each other. Yeah. Uh, and from what I've gathered, Sebastian in this film and in all of the anime mm. is much softer and more gentle with Seal compared to where he is in the manga, where he reminds you, the reader, over and over again that he is deliberately torturing or inflicting trauma on Seal yeah. to make his soul tastier for when the time comes to claim it. Yeah. So uh, it's like having that in the back of my mind while watching this was just like, it's interesting that they've softened it for the animation. Yeah. But uh, knowing that that's there and then seeing that sequence, I was like, it makes me want a little bit, a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> but Ian, do you recommend Black Butler? I... Kind of do if you are into anime, uh, if you're into manga, if you're into Japanese style, art styles, if you're into demons and zombies and, you know, you, there are millions of them out there. there. There are so many to list off that I just can't list them all and people would probably tell you to watch this one, that one, this one, that one, this one. Watch this one in this order, then go back and watch this one, but watch this one first, but watch this one in its original Japanese. There's the whole of them. If you needed something easy and what we've talked about has caught your interest, watch it. You know, you may never decide to watch the, the, the uh, rest of the anime seasons or read the manga, but at least with this, at the end of it, you can say, ah, I got something. And that's all you need at the end. Yeah. Well, I am so far out of my element <laughs> okay. here yeah. that I would take my opinions of Black Butler with a pinch of salt. <laughs> yeah, you know? okay. This is my first introduction to this story, its characters and world, that I was fairly lost on what <laughs> and why characters behaved the way they do. And Book of the Atlantic introduces so many colourful, over-the-top characters with history and agendas that were not really easy to follow. As an outsider watching this, I enjoyed the zombie supernatural horror yeah. on a Titanic-themed luxury cruise ship with some decent horror and action moments. The pace was good, except for the long backstory of the protagonist right at the end of the film. <laughs> the art style, though, was utterly amazing. The details, the colour, the animation, it was flawless. From the action moments to the over-stylized sections, it really was a joy to look at and watch. Just stunning. I'd say give this a watch. It's worth a try. Especially for the eccentric characters with odd quirks, uh, for the great art and direction with some good voice actors and some atmospheric music. I'm not a huge fan of Japanese animation or manga. I don't know it very well, but this was an interesting watch, which made me want to find out more about the wider story. So, yeah, I think Black Butler, definitely worth a watch. Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews. まるでうさぎ狩りだね。さて、狩られるうさぎはどちらかな？<笑>